What's up guys? My name is Kim and welcome to another episode of Captured Killers. And if you like true crime like I do, please hit that subscribe button. Hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it if you want to. Today we're going to be talking about the Lululemon murders that shocked the town of Bethesda, Maryland. It was a typical Friday where this horrible crime took place. The town was known for how safe it was. Other than the occasional drunk driver, they really didn't see a lot of crime and nothing like what happened on March 11, 2011. The Lulu manager, Rachel, came on Saturday to open up the store just to find that the door was unlocked. And so Rachel went inside the store and seen that it was dishuffled. It didn't look like its typical closing and so she walks a little bit further, sees that the registers are, you know, not as they typically are. And then she heard a moaning sound. And that was it for Rachel. She was like, oh no. So she ran out of the store, called 911. And during this call, a gentleman walked up and he asked her, you know, are you okay? Can I help you? And she's like, I think that somebody has broken into the store. So this gentleman offered kindly, I'll go in with you, we can check it out. And so Rachel in the meantime had hung up with 911 and then her and the gentleman walk into the store. He's leading the way, Rachel's kind of pacing behind him and she kind of stays back because they start seeing blood at this point. And he walks in and who does he find? There was two victims in this case. The first victim was Jaina Murray and the second was Brittany Norwood. So he sees the first victim and she's laying face down. There's a pool of blood around her and he could tell that she wasn't breathing. He's going back to exit the store when he hears the moaning again, which happened to be coming from the employee bathroom in the back of the store. So he opens up the door, which is a little bit stiff, but he does get it open and he finds Brittany Norwood. Brittany Norwood was laying on her back. She had zip ties around her hands and her feet, and it appeared she had a large gash in her face. She was covered in blood, and then she had like small gashes in her clothing. She's non-responsive. She seems to be passed out. And so he walks out of the store. They call 911 back, him and Rachel, the, ma the store manager. And Rachel tells them, there's two victims. We need an ambulance now. She's still breathing. Hurry, get somebody here. And so that's exactly what they did. So the officers arrive and they see exactly as they described. They come across the first body who's in the hallway, which was identified as Jana Murray. Jana Murray was only 30 years old and Gina had a very bright future ahead of her. She came from a great family. Her father had served in the Special Forces for two tours of Vietnam. They grew up in Texas. Gina, during high school, was known to be a very star athletic player. Gina graduated from high school and ended up going to college to get her bachelor's degree in business. She went to Georgetown University and she spent a semester in Spain as well as studying on the sea, which is interesting. I didn't even know you could do that. After graduating with her bachelor's degree, she ended up getting a job as a marketing rep at Halliburton. She stayed at Halliburton for just about three years. But then she decided she wanted to go back and get her master's degree. And so she ended up going to John Hopkins. Clearly, Gina was really working on her future and she knew getting her master's degree would just take her a little bit further. And during this time, she has to write a thesis paper. And so she decides to write her paper on the Lululemon model. She liked the fact that they invested in their employees, had them make goals for themselves, their corporate structure, their marketing because of course Lululemon is a high-end athletic wear. She just admired it and what a better way to get an inside source than just not only learning about it and googling but actually being part of it and working there. 
So that's what initially brought Jaina to Lululemon. She wanted to advance at Lululemon because it started out as a thesis paper, but she really got to know the staff, was really enjoying working with them and the company as a whole. And so she thought after she got her master's degree, she could be promoted. She had some goals set and she was achieving them. Although it only started as a short term deal, she ended up staying. She had been there for two years at this point. Everybody that came in contact with Gina only had positive things to say about her. They said she was a straight shooter, but she was fair, she was honest, and people generally just got along with her. They just didn't have anything negative to say. She sounded like a very ambitious, outgoing, athletic person someone that you'd like to hang out with. Brittany was one of nine children, so she had eight siblings. Her father ran a small upholstery business. Although he had this successful business, they weren't rolling in the dough, especially at how large their family was. But it sounded like their upbringing was happy. All the other siblings in the family seemed to be doing really well. Brittany was really good at soccer, and so, it wasn't a big surprise that she would get a soccer scholarship and she ended up going to Stony Brook to play on their soccer team. She was heavily into weight training, spin classes, and of course yoga. She really focused on her appearance. She always had her nails done, always had her hair done, always had expensive clothes on. She just really took pride in her appearance. It was very important to her. After Stony Brook, she moved to Maryland and she was working at a high-end hotel. But the high-end hotel, she just wanted more. She wanted more than ever to become a personal trainer. That was her ultimate goal. But she ended up quitting the hotel, which she was doing client services. She started at the front desk, but they promoted her to client services to make sure that the high-end customers were being satisfied, say they needed some dry cleaning or they needed whatever, Brittany would take care of that for her. But she didn't stay there long. She ended up going to Lululemon. She worked at one location of Lululemon and then was transferred. And so she had only worked at the Bethesda, Maryland location for only three weeks. So very new to her. But come to find out, Brittany wasn't all that her appearance showed. Brittany had a lot of dark secrets, and we'll go ahead and talk about those in a minute. So after these two girls were found by the detectives, the detectives are just doing initial search. And what they're finding is Again, the registers are open. They had a safe under each register. Those were open as well. There's nowhere that I could find that stated if there was money taken, how much money there was, or if the money was ever found. There, there just wasn't a lot of information about that. But clearly, it looked like a robbery that had gone wrong. There was mannequins knocked over. There was racks and hangers on the floor. The toolbox had been messed with. So everything was just kind of dishuffled and it looked like there was a struggle. The scene was very, very brutal. There was traces of blood up the walls, a pooling. Jaina was almost not identifiable. Her body had been beaten so brutally. Brittany had the ripped clothes, the inseam around her, around the crotch area had been ripped. She was covered in blood and then she had a huge gash on her forehead. Brittany was immediately taken to the hospital in an ambulance. So they take her to the hospital and the, nurse, the nurses and the doctors clean her up. She ended up having to get staples or uh, stitches in her forehead because that one was pretty deep. I think she had another wound on her arm, I believe, that she needed stitches as well. But other than that, all of the other wounds were superficial. They looked more like scratches once they were cleaned up. It was big difference between Jaina, who's almost not identifiable, and then you have Brittany that has superficial wounds. So that was concerning of how one 
attack took place, but totally different outcomes for each of them. Brittany described the men as being two white males, one taller than the other, wearing all black with ski mask. Brittany also stated that she had been, her and Jaina both had been beaten and sexually assaulted. According to Brittany, the masked men also used racial slurs during the attack. The detectives were a little bit leery and suspicious of her story. It just almost seemed too good to be true. So the detectives asked her, so they were racist? Yep. So they were rapist as well? Yep. The robbers? Yep. Yep. And they are murderers? Mm-hmm. Yep. They did that. So they were a little concerned that this doesn't seem like a likely scenario. It was like everything that's bad about a person is like the perfect situation that happened. It just wasn't making sense. So Brittany was alive with just few injuries. Jaina suffered 331. Wrap your mind around that. Wounds, which included beating, cutting, stabbing, and choking. And it just wasn't making sense. It looked like a crime of passion just with the amount of force that went into Jaina's death. Sorry to be so graphic, but it's just important to understand how different each person's wounds were between Jaina and Brittany. The detectives found a red toolbox next to Jaina and it appeared that the weapons that were used on Jaina were weapons from the Lululemon red toolbox. So a hammer, a coat uh, shelving, but that was used. Just multiple weapons from this toolbox were used. So these men that were attackers and wanting to rob didn't bring any tools with them. They only used the items within the store. Brittany was tied up with zip ties. Those zip ties were also Lululemons. It just appeared that these attackers came in unprepared and just used whatever they could get their hands on and knew that there, this toolbox had items in there to, to do this attack. The detectives are just like, this is just not making sense. But they continue down their path. They only have one story right now. And so they're doing everything they can to get to the bottom of it but they're suspicious. So Brittany also went into a little bit more detail about the circumstances of what happened that night. And so what Brittany said was they had closed the store, nothing out of the ordinary. Brittany and Jaina leave, Jaina locks the door. Brittany gets almost to the Metro system and is looking for her Metro card. And she realizes that she forgot it at the store. So she calls one of the employees that she had the phone number to and asks the girl to give her Jaina's phone number so she could call her to open up the store for her so she could grab her wallet with her Metro card. And so the girl said, hey, why don't you call Rachel, the store manager, because she just lives right across the street and she can come over and open it for you. And she's like, oh no, I'm sure Jaina hasn't even made it to her car yet. I, I need Jaina's phone number. The girl says, okay. And she gives her Jaina's phone number. She calls Jaina. Jaina's like, okay, no problem. Jaina was like, oh, I forgot my laptop anyways. So that's fine, I can come back. And so Brittany and Jaina walk into the store, are looking for Brittany's wallet. They can't find it. They can't find the Metro card. Jaina being the good person that she is, she says, hey, just take my Metro card. We'll work it out tomorrow, no big deal. That was decided. And then when they walk back out of the store is when the two men dressed in black showed themselves and then the attack started. Brittany stated that the attackers threatened to slit her throat if she didn't do exactly what they said. They drug her to the bathroom and sexually assaulted her. She said that she could hear Jaina, but she was in the other room and she wasn't sure what was going on. She said that she heard screams and then she heard silence. Brittany couldn't give a description of these attackers, only that they were only wearing black 
and they were white males, but she couldn't give any other details as eye color, hair color, any other details than just the basics. She said at one point she must have blacked out and she didn't remember much until they were taking her out of the store to the ambulance. Brittany's story was kind of lining up because when the detectives went into the store, there was two sets of footprints, one that was a smaller shoe size and one that was a larger size 14 shoe size. It was kind of going with her story that one man was a lot larger than the other one. So the manager that had opened the store, her name was Rachel, and she's of course the one that found them. She was interviewed by the detectives about both Jaina and Brittany, just trying to get some more information or if she knew any more information from Rachel. What's interesting is Jaina, the night before, had called Rachel and said, hey, I think Brittany stole a pair of leggings. It's a company policy that they always open up their bag and show the each person their bag before they leave just to make sure it keeps everybody honest. It's just a company policy. When you work in retail, it's not uncommon. It's nothing to be offended by. You just open up your bag, they look at it, and you walk out the door, no big deal. Well, when Jaina asked Brittany, oh, um, do you have a receipt for those leggings? She was like, oh, I paid so-and-so earlier for these leggings. And so they tried to go back into the computer system to find the receipt, but they had already closed everything down. They couldn't find this receipt that they were looking for. And then Brittany was like, would you want me to call the girl? And Gina's like, no, that's fine. We'll just... We'll figure it out later. When Jaina left the store, she ended up calling this other employee to say, hey, did you ring out Brittany for a pair of leggings? And the girl was like, no. So that's when Jaina called Rachel and told Rachel, you know, I think we have a problem. The detectives found this really interesting that there was some trouble in paradise with them too because Brittany may have been concerned that Jaina was gonna tell on her for these leggings. And what's more interesting is that Wednesday, this incident happened on Friday, the Wednesday prior to that, they had suspected that Brittany had been taking things. Things were just coming up missing, just little things, perfume bottles, different items that were just suspiciously coming up missing, and it was only when Brittany was working. And so on that Wednesday, they said, hey, all the managers, just be on the lookout if we find anything else, then we're going to have to let her go. I don't know if Brittany was on to this conversation that they had on that Wednesday, but it was apparent people were suspicious of Brittany, and I'm sure she felt it. So the next day, they were able to pull up the footage from the Apple store that was next door. They had CCTV, and they happened to pull up two white men dressed in all black, walking by the, the Apple store, which is right next to the Lululemon store, so essentially walking by the Lululemon store. And one man was taller than the other. So they're like, bingo, yep, that's it. And they're thinking, okay, maybe this are the two men that Brittany's talking about. So they canvassed the place um, trying to search out who these two men were. So the detectives go to the Apple store, which is next door to the Lululemon. They actually share a wall. Uh, that's how close they are. And they ask them, do you recognize these two men? And they say, no, we have no idea. But they did have some information about that Friday night where the incident, when the incident took place. They heard screaming, yelling. They heard someone say, let's just talk about it. And another voice saying, God, please help me. And what's interesting is they heard two female voices. They did not hear a male voice at all. They only heard female voices. They were a little bit concerned. They're actually on camera footage, these employees, like standing in the middle of the store listening for it because they were so loud. But the security guard there, because the Apple store had a, a guard, they have a lot of high-end products, very expensive, and so they had this, this guard there. So the guard goes over and bangs on the wall, and then the noises stopped. Nobody went over to check on them. Nobody called 911. They just banged on the wall. 
So the investigators back at the Lululemon store, they're looking at the crime scene and they happen to come across in a display, Lululemon doesn't sell shoes, but they do have a pair of shoes, say that you're trying on a pair of leggings and you came in with high heels and you just wanna throw on a pair of tennis shoes to kind of get the look and feel of what they look like with tennis shoes. They have a very large size 14. And these shoes are just for them to keep on hand if they ever need them for try on purposes. Well, what's interesting about these shoes that they found is that they were cleaned on the bottom. Now they had blood on the top of them, but it looked like somebody had cleaned the bottom. And the detectives found this really interesting because if a murderer came in there, they don't sell shoes, so they weren't expecting shoes to be there, but they used these shoes, cleaned them up, and put them back in the rack. It's just seeming like more and more of an inside job than it is a murderer coming unprepared with any items, swapping out shoes, leaving the shoes and cleaning them. It's just very bizarre. Things were just not lining up. So remember Brittany said that she had been pulled into this bathroom and she had been beaten and they sexually assaulted her. Brittany, when she goes to the emergency room, they do a kit on her to see if she had been assaulted. And by now, the detectives have the results of that kit that was done and come to find out it showed no evidence of what Brittany was claiming. So they're like, what is going on? This is not making sense. They were also concerned about this cut that was in the middle of her forehead. If you're getting attacked by somebody, it's, it's an odd placement. It would be on the side, it would be in the back, but in the middle of the front is just a bizarre place. What they're thinking is more of if she was attacking somebody and is doing this and accidentally comes back and hits herself because it was dead center in her forehead. So they were just a little concerned about the placement of her wound. And mind you, her other wounds on her are superficial. So Gina, going back to her, by now the medical examiner has had time to do an autopsy and they had determined, like I said earlier, 331 wounds. Later in trial, when the medical examiner testified, he said that she most likely lived through all 330 of these wounds. It wasn't until the final blow that Jaina had passed. It's super sad. I mean, just brutal. It would have been approximately 8 to 17 to 30, they don't really know, but about average 17 minutes. Not to mention that the attacker had used different items. So the attacker would have had to have taken at least a second to walk and grab a different item or to set that item down and grab a different item, up to 10 different items. So there was some thought that went into it. This was prolonged. Enough time for the attacker to sit back and say, maybe I should stop but they didn't. So after two days of canvassing, trying to find these two men in black, the detectives see two men walking by in the evening, the same time that they were walking by, that they had seen in the camera footage. Come to find out, these are two, just two innocent dishwashers that work at the adjoining restaurant, the restaurant uh, around the corner, I guess. And so they were just innocent that walk that path often. So yeah, they would have been seen. And of course they're wearing all black because they're dishwashers, that's their uniform. So they were ruled out. So they were back to zero. Well, one. So by now they're kind of getting things together, putting the picture together. But one missing piece was where was Jaina's car? Jaina, had driven back to the store and a Brittany said that she parked right out front. Well, where's her car? It wasn't a legal place to park. You couldn't naturally park there. It wasn't a parking spot, but her car wasn't there. Her car was nowhere that they seen. It's a small town. And so apparently the officers talked to each other and the one officer was like, oh, I seen a car that matched 
that description and also had a Texas plate that was parked in a close by parking lot. I seen it the night before. I seen somebody in the driver's seat. They were just sitting there for a moment, but then eventually got out of the car and the police officer pulled away. He didn't really see where this person was going, but he said he did see it. So they went to that parking lot, they found her car, and in this car, they found both Jaina's blood, but also Brittany's blood as well. So this attacker must have driven the car to this location and walked back to the store. But what's interesting is they found a hat as well. And it actually was Brittany's hat. It had the blood right in the correct placement of where Brittany would have been hit in the head with a blood, you know, on the hat. The officers couldn't figure out why these attackers would have moved her car. But come to find out, Rachel lives right in the apartment across the street from the Lululemon. When she looks out her window, she can see the store. And also it was parked in a legal spot. The attacker would to have had to known that her car would have been identified. So the detectives called Brittany back into the station to ask her a few more questions. They wanted to get a DNA sample as well as uh, fingerprints and photographs and all the other detective stuff that they do. During this time that they asked for all this stuff, they casually brought up that they had found Jaina's car and Brittany just starts to sweat. She's like, oh no, whoops. They didn't say anything about they found anything or have done anything. They just mentioned that they had found her car. So they finish up the interview. Brittany is allowed to leave, so she leaves the station. But clearly, Brittany is freaking out. And why I suspect that she's freaking out is because later she called the police station or had her brother call and ask if she could come back in because she had some information that she hadn't told them before, but she really thinks it would be helpful in the investigation. So of course, the officers are like, yeah, please come back in, tell us what you you, what you have here, let us know. Yeah, come in. So she did. Brittany came back in. She said, there's, there's something I didn't tell you before, but this is what happened. See, the attackers made me get back into the car and drive it to that parking lot. And they told me if I much as talk to anybody that they were going to kill me. And they knew my address. They told me my address, so I was in fear of my life. So she ends up driving this car to the parking lot and walking back to her attackers. They said, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you walk back to your attackers? It, it just doesn't make sense. But she's stuck by her story that that she was just afraid for her life. So that's why she went back. If this were the case, she could have gotten that car and drove right to a police station and been out of harm's way. During this time, Brittany asked if she could leave. And this is a, a tactic that they do where they say, okay, okay, let's take a break. Let's get a breath of fresh air. We're gonna go do our thing. Do you wanna talk to your, your sister and brother because they were there? And she's like, sure. And so they come into the room. Her sister, I don't know if it was two different times. They did it multiple times. Well, there was one time when Brittany and her brother are alone. And Brittany's brother was like, you know, did you do this? And Brittany was like, no, no. Well, he kept on asking. And there was one time when she said, I can't talk about it here. She didn't say specifically I did it, but she kind of was bound going around it. I think it was clear at this point to, to the detectives that Brittany had something to do with it. Her vague answers, you would never, if you're innocent, say, I can't talk about it here. There's just no way you would do that. So she was under arrest that day. And so her trial started October 26th, 2011. So mind you, this murder happened in March, already in October, she's on, she's on trial. It, it happened really, really fast, but they had solid, solid evidence. So during this time, they were building their case and they were just finding out more and more about Brittany and the information that they were getting 
just did not match the girl that they were interviewing. They just really couldn't imagine that this girl had so many secrets. She had been kicked out of college. The soccer team that she played with, players were complaining that she was stealing stuff. There was no formal charges made, but she was asked to leave the university. She told her family that she had graduated, but because she had outstanding student loans, she wasn't able to walk, but that was totally false. She, she was asked to leave her senior year, never graduated. During this time that she was at university, she ended up um, scamming her roommate. Brittany was the one that paid the rent and the roommate just gave her the money and then Brittany paid in one lump sum. But apparently Brittany had told her roommate, hey, the rent went up $200. So you need to give me this much a month versus what you were paying me before. The roommate was a little suspicious of this, but she did. She did it. Well, come to find out the rent had never gone up and Brittany was just pocketing the money. This was her roommate. Super shady. So during the trial, of course, they're bringing up all of these things and the prosecution prior to when they started the trial wanted to bring in the conversation that Jaina and Rachel had had, but the judge said that that's hearsay. That's just Rachel saying something, speaking about a conversation and one person, Jaina, Jaina being deceased is not able to corroborate the story, the conversation. And so they said that it was inadmissible. They couldn't bring it up in court, which was unfortunate because that really brought motive. They didn't have a solid motive, but the prosecution just had so much information that it really didn't affect the case too much. They still had a solid case. And they had more of a solid case when the defense started their case with she just snapped she just lost it they he the defense attorney just kept on saying she just lost it she just lost it she she didn't premeditate this that she just lost it but the fact that she had specifically asked for Jaina to meet her at the store so the jury did come back and they did come back with a verdict of guilty of first degree murder to Brittany Norwood, which was totally, it was surprising because they didn't have a motive, but totally explainable if you had the information that she was stealing. Brittany was, she was applying for a job as a personal trainer. She wanted to be a personal trainer so bad. That was her goal. She just, that was just her her end game is she really wanted to be a personal trainer and she had a second interview for it and so it was believed that maybe Jaina brought that up that you know that second interview you have I'm going to let them know because everybody did describe her as a straight shooter she probably said it how it was she wasn't a nasty person but she just said how it was she didn't hide she wasn't shy she just said it how it was she knew wrong from right and wasn't afraid to verbalize it. I can respect that. So the defense's strategy, this is just my final thoughts, the defense's strategy that she just snapped, I initially, when I heard this story, cause I, you know, this is a girl that came from a good family. There was no evidence that she had a really hard upbringing of being impoverished or um, assaulted in any way. So it was just hard to believe that she came from this good family. She carried herself very well. What was this? Why? It's just hard to wrap your mind around how this person can just be so evil. It was easy at first for me to believe that she just snapped. She just really wanted this job and her feelings got the best of her. But then after I let it sink in and looked at this story, I really think that she had some evil intentions in her. The fact that she took breaks in between, how long it took, she wanted to make sure that Jaina did not leave there alive. I think that she thought about it 
and went back there with the intentions to make sure that happened. And that's why attack lasted so long, is that Jaina was a tough cookie. It's just sad, it's just sad. It really breaks my heart. This isn't the full version. If you want a very detailed one, Eleanor, I'll link her channel below, her video below. She does a full in-depth, it's a two-part series of this story. She goes into a lot more detail. This is just kind of a quick overview and uh, she goes into more detail, but it's amazing. I'm just shocked. I, I just couldn't believe this girl had so much vengeance in her. And I'm glad that she got life in prison without a possibility of parole. The judge was showing no mercy. She begged and said, you know, I need this not for me, but I need it for my family. Her family was supporting her behind her. She had a big network of family. And the judge was like, this is all the more reason that I'm going to keep you in jail is because you have the support system and you still did this. So that tells me that you're, you know, you're not worthy of being free or being paroled at any point. So Brittany will spend the rest of her life in prison as I feel she should, my opinion. But you guys let me know your opinion down below. I appreciate all your comments and I'll see you in my next one. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.